specialist, as well as I'm uh, the nursing director at National Guard Hospital Riyadh for emergency department and military care and hemodialysis. It's my pleasure to participate in tonight's event with the Neurocritical Care Chapter under the Saudi Critical Care Society. It's my pleasure to introduce to you my colleague, Dr. Rami al uh, Dr. Rami is a neurocritical care physician, assistant professor at University of Umm al-Qura in Mecca al-Mukarramah. He had obtained his uh, bachelor degree in medicine in 2010 from uh, King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah. And then he obtained his American board certification in neurology from George Washington University in the state. Uh, subsequently, he finishes his fellowship in neurocritical care from University of Miami. Uh, please, guys, welcome with me, Dr. Rami. Dr. Rami, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Is my voice clear? It is clear. You, you can share your screen. Thank you. Okay, great. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming and thanks to the committee for inviting me. Um, thank you for the introduction, Ms. Maha. We will talk about something that has a lot of uh, meaning. Anyone who is a neurologist, stroke care is, uh, has advanced a lot in the past 10 or 15 years. And uh, it's exciting time in the, in the stroke care because uh, if you look 30 years ago, a lot of mortality and disability were coming from stroke. So at least we're improving in the part of, uh, of that. But with that comes a package. Uh, there, is, there is more complex care in, uh, in, in patients with stroke. And the reason is there is more advancement in treatment. Uh, so in the, within the next hour or so, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit, uh, uh, less we'll we'll go over um, we'll go over the the stroke epidemiology in Saudi and the in the U.S. Some historical review of stroke management, and then the the bulk is going to be the neurocritical care management, especially the hemodynamic management of uh, of ischemic stroke. And then what are the current change uh, current cha challenges of uh, the management and the the current guidelines, and if there is any any future promising therapy. Uh, I have nothing to disclose, so we'll pass through this. Um, uh, acute ischemic stroke is the ultimate treatable neurological emergency, right? It's very time sensitive, and it's uh, uh, and the outcomes of treatment are are very exciting, right? And we'll talk about how exciting it is. Um, but we all know that brain is uh, time is brain, right? And every time goes by, there was a study that mentioned that every minute goes by in a stroke patient without treatment, around 2 million neurons actually die. Uh, so the new protocols for stroke, stroke, uh, stroke codes or brain attacks are aimed to minimize the time of treatment, whether it's about, uh, whether it's about the how fast you can get the CT scan, how fast you can get treatment, and the multidisciplinary interactions within the stroke teams. There are more than 800,000 people, anyone in the US that, uh, that uh, have a stroke. A lot of them have their first time stroke. Um, in one study in Saudi Arabia, the estimated prevalence is 40 per 100,000. Um, and the prevalence in the US is about 7 million people and in, in adults who have, who have stroke. It is still, unfortunately, the, the, the number one cause of, of morbidity and disability in the, in the US. Um, we'll start with, with, with this case. This, this is gonna make everything that we're, gonna, we're going forward with uh, easier on everyone because we all have seen a case like this. A 58 years old man with, with uh, hypertension presented to the ER with a sudden onset left-sided hemiplegia. And there isn't a lot of things in the neurology world that can cause uh, sudden onset lipid, left uh, hemiplegia. Um, he's one of the lucky ones. He has presented to the ER within three hours. And then this CT scan was taken in the emergency room, right? Um, and uh, a lot of us will, will look at the CT scan and will be very, very alert about what we are seeing. We see, we see a hyperdense, right, MCA, which is a sign of a large vessel occlusion. It means that there is a clot setting in the MCA and potentially in the ICA. 
Um, so this is, I think we all agree that this is an emergency. This is a patient that can have uh, very good outcomes with the precise management with all the advances in, in the stroke care now. Um, just a little bit of history on where we were and where we are now. Um, before 1995, where the approval of Alteplase came in, there wasn't a lot of options uh, that are approved to treat a patient like this, right? So a lot of these patients will have their stroke and will have to deal with their with the complication of their stroke, whether it's disability, whether it's cerebral edema, or, is it, or respiratory failure, or dysphagia, or malnutrition, all of these things. Uh, but in 1995, the first uh, NINDS stroke trial actually showed the improvement in patients with large visual occlusion um, if they were treated with intravenous alteplase within three hours. And this was very, very exciting, right? So a lot of patients, when they were treated within the treatment window, uh, got better outcomes on something called a modified ranking scale, which is the, the functional disability scale, uh, scale that is used in stroke patients. And this one it is tested at three months. So a lot of patients were, were treated. The number needed to treat in order to, to get one good outcome was for every 12 patients, you're gonna need 12 to 14 patients. You're gonna need, uh, you're gonna have one good outcome, which is huge because we had nothing before that. And then later these three hours in one of the other trials showed, uh, uh, showed that you can actually extend the time window into four and a half hours. And uh, patients still got, still got benefits from, um, from alteplase, inter intravenous alteplase. And that was also very exciting, right? So now not only the patient that were within the three hours period can be treated, but even up to four and a half hours, which gives you a little bit more flexibility. The International Stroke Trial in 2008 tried to extend the period of, uh, of treatment up to six hours. But then there was a problem with the, uh, there was a problem with, uh, with more hemorrhages. Right, and it makes sense, right? The more you, the more you wait on a stroke, the more it's gonna flower, the more it's gonna, it's gonna have uh, ischemic tissue and and make patients more prone to having hemorrhagic transformation. Right, and one problem came with that: all the IV alteplase uh, did not have that much with recanalization. Right, for large visual occlusions, you can see from this chart that the the chance of recanalization is almost zero, and it is zero. It's not almost zero. It's zero percent with the with the internal carotid artery occlusion, and then gets a little better as you go forward. So, in in the M1 segment of the middle cerebral artery, it goes up to ten percent, and the M2 seventeen percent, and fifteen percent for the basilar artery. But the the chances of recanalization is about ten percent overall. So, patients with large vessel occlusions they would not get, their chances of recanalization is low. And that's how the idea of mechanical thrombectomy and, uh, and therapeutic angiogram came in. And let me put this just one second. Yes, this is better. And this is where a lot of the, of the following studies, and now I cannot, okay. And this is where a lot of the following studies came in after, in two, between 2007 and 2013. We have the IMS trial, the PROAC trial, Mr. Rescue and Synthesis, and they all use different methodology. For example, in the IMS and PROAC trial, there was an installation of using a therapeutic angiogram. There is an installation of uh, local thrombolytic prouracinase, and it did improve outcome, but the, the risk of hemorrhage was up to 10%. Mr. Rescue and, thing, and Synthesis, which are another two trials that tried not local uh, thrombolytic, but more of mechanical embolectomy or thrombectomy, it did not improve outcomes, or the result of the study did not improve outcomes. And the reason why is that they included all the patients who had a night stroke scale of six and more. So what happens is that a lot of these patients did not have an LVO when they got them to the NG suite. So there was no proper tri <clears throat> triaging at the beginning. The other problem where, where they have is that there was no CT imaging criteria or no imaging criteria for patient selection. So 
did not use any uh, any uh, CT perfusion imaging or any aspect score, which is going to talk talk about it in a minute. The third problem, which contributed to the to the lack of of, of benefits, is the is the uh, the devices, the first generation thrombectomy and embolectomy devices, uh, which uh, resulted in a lot of problems, like technical problems. One of them was re reocclusion. The other one is incomplete incomplete uh, thrombectomy or incomplete extraction of the clot. And it was it was a dark period, like between 2008 and 2013. All these trials, all these trials were were negative or <clears throat> had complications until 2016, where there were or 2015, where there was like six different trials done all over the world: Australia, Europe, the U.S., Canada, that did show benefits in uh, in patients undergoing mechanical thrombectomy if they are properly selected. And if uh, within six hours period, so for example, in two of those trials, Mr. Clean um, and uh, they used the CTA first to confirm the the the, the presence of large vessel occlusion within six hours, and then uh, showed benefits with the number needed to treat very low number needed to treat, which is one in four. The other two trial, Rivas can escape in 2015. Um, did CTA to to uh, to confirm the LVO and use something called an aspect score on CT scan, which helps you stratify which patients would benefit more from thrombectomy and which patients are more likely to 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 have hemorrhagic transformation. And again, within six hours period, patient had better outcomes. Uh, a little more advanced in Swift Prime and Extend. Patient selection was a little more advanced in Swift Prime and Extend, where CT perfusion imaging used to select patients uh, who have a small infarct core and using the rapid software calculate the volume of the core infarct. And within six hours, they went, they went in and did thrombectomy and they showed that they have better outcomes. So all the problems from the earlier trials were overcome by, by, uh, by using imaging criteria plus the clinical manifestation. And this is not the only good news. And then in 2018, there are two large trials that was done, which is Dawn and Diffuse. And it did extend, like both of them, they, they use different methodology, but it did, it did um, approve mechanical thrombectomy up to 24 hours post, post TPA, or oh, post uh, last known well. And the way they use it, they use CT perfusion in one of them uh, to calculate the core volume or the clinical, <clears throat> clinical radiographic mismatch to select patients who will benefit from, from, uh, from the intervention. Um, all of that people forgot about Alteplase, but Alteplase actually actually had like is still being is still kicking in. Um, the wake up trial in 2018 used a very simple methodology, uh, which they used MRI, right? Sorry. They used MRI to, to divide patients presenting within nine hours now. Presenting within nine hours into two groups, right? So if there is a mismatch between the diffusion signals and the flare signals, they would be given TPA and uh, alteplase. And if there is not, they wouldn't be. And it did show better outcomes as well. So now we have many, many options for treatment, right? We have treatment options for up to 24 hours for mechanical thrombectomy in selected patients, and also for uh, alteplase uh, in patients with uh, with acute stroke within nine hours, also in selected patients. Uh, the extent uh, extent trial in 2020 uh, did examine another another thrombolytic, which is tenecteplase. And earlier, earlier studies showed that tenecteplase is associated with the better reperfusion uh, and better recanalization. But when it was uh, tested against alteplase, it showed non-inferiority, so the same outcomes. It did not have any superior outcome compared to alteplase, uh, but it showed non-inferiority. So that's great. Now we have two options for thrombolytics. We have alteplase and tenecteplase if, if we want to use.
And we talked about this earlier, right? Acute management of ischemic stroke is more complex today, um, but the problem with complexity of care is that it comes with a baggage and it raises most question in the immediate post-treatment period. Like whatever you had before and you learned before about the treatment of stroke is now different because you have a new variable. You have recanalization either via alteplase or, or, uh, or thrombectomy or both. Okay. And currently one in four uh, treated stroke patients either with, with thrombectomy or, uh, or, or alteplase will need critical care intervention only provided in the ICU. Now we're, we're rationalizing why we need ICU because one of the four, four patients will need ICU care. And we'll talk about the ICU uh, indications for, for, for uh, stroke patients. Uh, the current recommendation from the HASA is to admit patients to the ICU, preferably a neuro ICU or a specialized stroke unit after treatment with either alteplase or thrombectomy. So no regular word, right? Because these treatment, they come with complications and with brain, brain is not very forgiving. So whatever happens in the brain as a, as a complication needs to be addressed immediately uh, because early time is brain, right? Um, admission to a stroke unit or uh, ICU or neuro ICU has been shown to improve outcomes, early recognition of complication and immediate therapeutic in case of complication. Um, and this is some of the uh, this is some of the ICU indications for stroke patients. Some of them are uh, some of them are. Are, are very logical, but there are things that are specific to, to, to stroke. And the most common indication for ICU admission is hemodynamic management, post thrombectomy or IV thromb, uh, alteplase, or the need for hemodynamic support in patients who are blood pressure dependent where, where their symptoms are fluctuating based on their blood pressure. Patient with cerebral edema, uh, and you can kind of anticipate uh, those patients early from the uh, from the beginning, but patients with more than 50% infarction of the MCA territory, patients with cerebellar stroke involving more than one third of the cerebellum. Um, this is tough, right? Because um, you can anticipate that there's going to be edema and there's going to there might be brainstem compression. So you got to be you got to be uh, ready. Uh, and also patients with signs of herniation. And usually those patients, they will go to the ICU and then to prepare them actually to go for surgery. Patients with hydrocephalus will most likely get a, an EVD. Um, and this cannot be managed anywhere else other than the ICU. Uh, patients with symptomatic hemorrhagic transformation and coagulopathy, these patients can fluctuate. You, have a, you should have a low threshold to repeat imaging. You should have frequent neuro checks, cannot be managed anywhere else. Patients who are comatose or GCS score of less than nine um, will be in the ICU. A lot of these patients will be intubated um, and patient with status epilepticus, which can happen in stroke. Cardiac ind indications is mainly for hemodynamic augmentation for those who are hypotensive. Patients who have concomitant uh, MI with a stroke or arrhythmias that are refractory to treatment so they need to be on drips, they need to be on, uh, on beta blockers or amiodarone or whatever it is. Patients who are in heart failure who require uh, inotropic uh, support. And patients with mechanical hardware, with the cardiac mechanical valves on anticoagulation with moderate to large stroke. And this is one of my first cases as, a, as an attending, as a consultant, is that somebody with a mechanical valve who had a thalamic stroke with a little bit of blood and uh, high INR and what to do with them. Tough case. Um, respiratory indication is basically respiratory failure, so whether it is because of aspiration, is it because of uh, central respiratory failure and hypo, hypopnea or apnea, they will be, they will be in the ICU, like, for, like you're not gonna manage them anywhere else. And of course, patients with sepsis or septic shock, they'll, they'll probably be in the ICU as well. 
and patients with renal failure. And we'll talk a little bit about why with patients with renal, whether it's an, like a new onset acute renal failure or, uh, or renal failure, like chronic renal failure on uh, renal replacement therapy. So a lot of these indications are, are, are very, like, very logical, right? They're like anyone can think about it. Okay, back to the back to the case. So we have an exam that is notable. Now we're examining this patient, notable for left-sided hemiplegia, neglect, and homonymous hemianopsia. So right MCA syndrome, right? A night stroke scale of 15 and blood pressure of uh, 200 over 10. Patient is awake, she sees like 12, 13, and the glucose is 220. So this is like a golden patient, right? So this patient is came in within the window. He has a, he has an evidence of large vessel occlusion or imaging. There is no bleeding, hypertensive, and uh, have a high NIH stroke scale. So he's eligible to almost all kind of treatment, all the treatment options that we have for stroke. Uh, glucose is elevated, and we'll talk about this later. So hyperacute management, like what? And this is this might be uh, directed more toward the ICU and the ER physician, hyperacute right now treatment uh, is, if you look at it this way, it's, it's actually very simple, like ABC, right? We always say ABC. And uh, it, stroke patient, it's a little different uh, where you have to do some modifications considering um, cerebral perfusion, blood pressure and airway compromise. Um, this is easy, right? Patients who, who are critically ill, who are in respiratory failure, they, whether they have they have a stroke or they don't have a stroke, they'll probably have, they'll probably need an indication. But a lot of stroke patients uh, require intubation not because of of uh, uh, inability to to oxygenate or ventilate, but it's because more commonly because due to failure to protect airways. So patients with brainstem, thalamic, or or uh, or uh, cerebellar stroke or midbrain stroke, they will be, they will have low GCS, right? GCS score less than eight, either due to the edema from a midline shift from a big stroke or due to the stroke itself. And they will need to be intubated. Other patients may be awake, but they will still need intubation because of dysphagia and inability to, to manage the secretions, right? The oropharyngeal secretions. So the very high risk for, for uh, aspiration and intubation may reduce that risk. And this is common also with cerebellar brainstem and large hemispheric stroke, right? Unfortunately, there is no current recommendation or guidelines on which induction agent is used is superior in terms of hemodynamic, in terms of uh, outcomes, like is propofol better than ketamine, is uh, etomidate better than either of them? which one is associated more with better outcomes. Uh, but what needs to be considered uh, during intubation is the minimal hemodynamic instability or fluctuation, right? Um, and again, there is no head-to-head -head trials, there is no uh, guidelines, but some reports suggest that the use of uh, ketamine and propofol or ketofol may be of benefits uh, and we used to think that ketamine increases the ICP and a lot of reports recently said that ketamine has actually a beneficial effect in, on, uh, on, uh, on ICP and also um, is used to treat status epilepticals. So it's, it's uh, it, and some, some, some reports also said that's neuroprotective. And all of this evidence or all of this literature is coming from TBI. So nothing is specific for stroke. Uh, what's different is that for thrombectomy procedure, uh, patients, there's, there was always this debate whether which one is better, right? Which one is, uh, uh, is better for patients, general anesthesia with intubation or conscious sedation. And there was a big trial that was published uh, a few years ago, like five or six years ago, that showed that actually conscious sedation is associated with better outcomes in sense of uh, time to intubation, waking up patients and, and getting uh, neuro exams and less hemodynamic instability. But then other reports like a year or two years ago showed that similar outcomes, so it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, so it is now left to, left to the discretion of the interventional team anesthesia. For me personally, and this is my personal opinion, 
uh, of course, conscious sedation is better, but if the patient is moving or if there is some difficulties and hemodynamic instability that requires uh, or, or respiratory uh, compromise, of course, the uh, general anesthesia would be better. The biggest thing to, to, to look into and to pay attention to is the blood pressure fluctuation because you have, uh, because you have uh, cerebral perfusion pressure that you need to be maintaining. And it's mainly dependent on the, on the mean arterial pressure. Um, and this is, and I'm writing this because I, I was burned uh, before, but just get a nice drug scare before intubation, before uh, paralyzing the patient and, and, and sedating them. Um, so the, 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 like the key word is that, okay, we don't know which agent is better, uh, we lean toward more conscious sedation than general anesthesia for the procedure, for thrombectomy procedures. Uh, blood pressure management is the, like maybe the biggest thing about uh, stroke management. Uh, and this slide should be at the end because it's kind of summarized what we're gonna talk about. But um, hypotension is very uncommon in stroke patients. And it's usually a result of either herniation or, uh, or, or midline shift. Uh, it should be treated and investigated, and we'll talk about why. The guidelines now recommend the blood pressure, uh, lowering blood pressure to less than 180 over 110 before starting autoplays. So if you have our patient was 200 over 120, 220 over 120. Uh, so as the patient is walking in and you see the, the indication and no contraindication for autoplays, the blood pressure should be lowered carefully to below 180 over 110 before starting alpha plays. I know some people will say that, well, that's gonna delay treatment. Well, the, the benefit outweighs the rest. Uh, strict normotension versus permissive hypertension uh, resulted in less hemorrhagic transformation. Um, and this is in the, in the hyperacute post-TPA period for 24 hours, but there was no difference in the functional outcomes. And there is more hypertension in the strict normotension group. So the the uh, the take home message did not change the the uh, the guidelines. It's still, less than one eighty over one ten is the same as less than one forty, even with less hemorrhagic transformation. And for twenty four hour post alteplase, blood pressure should be maintained less than one eighty over one ten uh, to minimize the risk for hemorrhagic transformation, mainly related to alteplase. If they're gonna bleed, they're gonna bleed to cannot prevent that. Okay, back, back to the case. Uh, a patient was treated with IV nicardipine to lower the blood pressure to 160 over 90. Um, an alteplase was given, uh, bolus and the infusion, and after one hour, the patient is still symptomatic. There is no improvement. Still with left hemiplegia and left neglect and a night stroke of 15. So the patient was wheeled back to the CTA and it showed right ICA MCA occlusion, and we now know from this uh, from this slide that the the uh, the chance of recanalization for this patient is is low, right? It's about ten percent. So the patient and he's presenting within the therapeutic window within three hours or four hours now. So he was taken to the angio suite, and in the right, in the left side, you can see the uh, like in the B part, you can see that there is an occlusion of the distal ICA and uh, and MCA. There is no, there is no flow behind that, but he underwent. So he underwent uh, a successful mechanical thrombectomy, full reperfusion of the MCA territory, and was transferred after that to the ICU or the new ICU, whatever you prefer. Um, in the ICU management, the biggest thing, which uh, which especially especially in the first twelve hours following uh, the first twenty four hours following the the thrombectomy or alteplase, is the frequent neuromonitoring and the Q one hour neuro exam. Um, and um, our nurses help us a lot in that, right? So this is big part is one of the biggest uh, nursing responsibility. Because these patients can 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 deteriorate very quickly, um, um, some of the protocols, especially in the first three hours, would have a fifty a Q fifty minutes neuro exam. Um, and then the 
this is for the for the for the Q1 or neuro exam, but then hemodynamic management will take place in the in the uh, in the ICU. The management of hemorrhagic transformation, if it happened, and or cerebral edema will also be managed. We'll talk about it in a minute, and will will take place in the in the uh, ICU. Uh, seizures and cardiopulmonary complication can happen and needs to be addressed early and treated. The last thing you want is that mechanical thrombectomy patient improved and then they go into rapid AFib and they reocclude their ICA. This is, like, this, is, this is not a good story. Uh, okay. Uh, we, we said that earlier, the hemodynamic management is the perhaps the most common indication for neurocritical care admission. Uh, continuous infusion of, uh, of antihypertensive to keep the blood pressure less than 180 over 105 after recanalization, either with the use of infusion like nicardipine or boluses like hydralazine or libetalol, depends on like, how the heart rate of the patient is. Uh, but the biggest caveat is that blood pressure goal is different for non-recanalized patients. So if you have a patient with acute ischemic stroke who is not uh, who is not treated with thrombectomy or or uh, alteplase, uh, there is a there is a, a bigger role for permissive hypertension in those patients. So these patients should be maintained at less than two twenty over one twenty. And the reason, the reason why is that there is, in those patients, there is a U-shape uh, relationship between mortality and, uh, between mortality and, uh, and systolic, blood, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So patients on the lower end of the lower and the highest end of blood pressure had higher mortality. And this goes, and the reason for that is that this goes back to the cerebral autoregulation. So autoregulation is, um, is the ability of the brain to maintain constant cerebral perfusion pressure uh, within a range, right? So within this range, whether it's on the lower end between 40 and 140, some say 50 and 150, but within this range, the, the cerebral perfusion pressure is constant. If the blood pressure is low, there is uh, vasodilation. If the blood pressure is high, there is vasoconstriction. Oh, sorry. And what happens? Okay. And what happens with uh, if you if you go below, there is maximum vasodilation, but there isn't enough uh, enough blood going because of the high because of the low cerebral perfusion pressure, which is mainly determined by the by the uh, uh, by the mean arterial pressure. So you get ischemia, you get extension of the infarct growth, uh, growth, and you get uh, larger stroke co core. Uh, and if you go over, there is at some point there is hyperperfusion because you exceed the capacity of the cerebral autoregulation. You get hyperperfusion, you get uh, worsening of cerebral edema and potential for hemorrhagic transformation. Uh, so too little blood is not good. Too much blood is not good too. And this is impaired in this in the hemisphere that is uh, that is that has the stroke. A lot of reports uh, showed that the the cerebral autoregulation is impaired. So patients who are used to cerebral perfusion pressure at this point, if you get them down to this point, they may not have the ability uh, to autoregulate. So this uh, this graph is shifted to the right. Right, so patient will go into ischemia and increase in the infarct growth uh, uh, earlier. Um, this is the U-shaped distribution that we spoke about earlier. Uh, mortality increase at the lower, uh, the lower, the at the extremes, and kind of the same at the at the autoregulatory uh, range. Um, and the blood pressure management, there is like a long story behind blood pressure management. Uh, people started paying attention for to a lot of these uh, patients, a lot of these patients uh, after 2011. So there was two trials in 2011, uh, the SCAS trial and COSAC's trial. And what they did is that in the, in the SCAS trial, they had patients with stroke 
and blood pressure more than 140. They gave them either candesetran to control the blood pressure or placebo. Um, there was no modifying, there is no functional benefits at six months, even with the treatment group where they have lower blood pressure. Um, the problem with this trial that it did include everyone, acute and hemorrhagic stroke treated with alteplase and not treated with alteplase. So there is an issue with patient selection. Uh, COSACs had the same problem. They included uh, hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke. And the, uh, what they did is that there was a, the, like a group stopped their hypertension and there was a placebo group that uh, there was another group that was uh, kept at less than 140. Uh, it was underpowered, but there was no uh, functional benefits as well. In 2014, the CATIS trial, also another negative trial, uh, decided uh, divided the the stroke cases, the ischemic stroke cases into blood pressure 140 to 220 with the intensive group and another group that has no antihypertensive, but not exceeding 220. Um, and again, there was no functional or mortality benefit at three weeks. And this was done, I think, in, in China. Uh, in trial used transdermal nitrate versus placebo to target blood pressure less than 140. And again, uh, they included both his ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. And there was no difference in 90 days mortality or functional benefits. And in 2019, the Enchanted trial was a well, a well designed trial, uh, and it included patients with acute ischemic stroke who had uh, thrombolytics, alteplase, and divided them into two groups, either less than 180 or less than 140 for 72 hours. And uh, they tested the outcomes of these patients at, uh, at three months. And functional-wise, they are the same, mortality-wise, the same. The only thing that, ha that was better in the strict normal intensive group was there was less hemorrhagic transformation. Uh, but it did not, statistically speaking, it did not uh, affect the outcomes, like the general outcomes. Uh, all of these studies did not consider endovascular treatment. Uh, so all of them were either stroke, hemorrhagic, ischemic, or uh, alteplase and enchanted, but none of these uh, consider endovascular treatment. After endovascular uh, treatment, it is a statement that the guideline says this is the 180 over 105, right? But this number is coming from um, the... RCT, the randomized controlled trial protocols, mainly done and, and diffuse, which those two trials extended the window to 24 hours. But there wasn't a, there wasn't a, uh, a randomized controlled trial that tested strict normal tension versus, versus uh, permissive hypertension to 180. There is no Mr. RCT. Mr. Rami, no, sorry man. to disturb you. Can, can you sure. please make your slides on slideshow so the slides will be clear to the audience? Of course. Thank you. Um, and the problem with that is that is that a lot of these patients, uh, hypoperfusion may harm the penumbra and causes impart core growth. Uh, and hyperperfusion increases the risk of hemorrhagic transformation. So it's a it's, it's a very thin line, right? And it's not easy to 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 dance around that line that line, but it should be dependent on the reperfusion status. And we do have something called a TIKI score. Um, we, uh, that assess the, uh, the um, reperfusion status. And it goes from zero to three. Three is everyone's, uh, everyone's ideal outcome, which is full reperfusion of the, of the tester branches. And zero is no perfusion. And you get grade one and two with partial perfusion. So the blood pressure goal uh, should be individualized based on the reperfusion status, uh, rather than the uh, like a one li one line statement is that oh less than one eighty okay well how about this patient who had take a score of three right they have full reperfusion they should they should be targeted at uh, at one forty there is a lot there is a lot of debate about this, but in a recent cohort it divided patients after successful recanalization into three groups, 
one group is less than 140 of the blood pressure of the systolic and less than 160 and less than 180. And the first group with the blood pressure less than 140 is associated with better functional outcomes and lower ICH. Um, and those are those are uh, TK3 patients, right? So now there is uh, there is more uh, there is more uh, movement toward lower blood pressure goals uh, to reduce the risk of the biggest thing is hemorrhagic transformation, right? Hemorrhagic transformation, but also reperfusion injury and the need for hemicranium. Um, Another study was talking about targeting MAP more than targeting the, uh, the, the systolic blood pressure. And uh, from three separate RTC, the MAP less than 70 is, and more than 80, more than 90 is associated with poor outcomes after endovascular treatment. And it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, it correlates with, with, uh, with the cohort study earlier that showed that higher blood pressure is associated with, with higher uh, complication rates in, in fully recanalized patients. After all of this, there is, there is a major bot in the recommendation, right? And it's not, it's not uh, written clearly in the, in the recommendation, but uh, blood pressure dependent stroke worsening is, is a different category, right? So a lot of patients will have their uh, mild stroke symptoms at the blood pressure of 180 and or 200 and you drop their blood pressure into 160 or 150 and their stroke symptoms worsens. And it's the patient exam that is telling you is like, okay, I, I like to live at the blood pressure of 190 or 200. So those patients who are, they're not the majority of patients, but they have to be uh, uh, adequately resuscitated with fluid, may need to use vasopressors or inotropic agent to enhance the cerebral perfusion pressure and minimize the stroke core volume, right? Because those patients who are uh, blood pressure dependent, if you drop their blood pressure, the reason why they're worsening is that they started to extend their infarct core um, and start to hurt the penumbra even more. So you try to salvage the penumbra by maintaining a higher, a higher blood pressure. Um, hemorrhagic transformation, this is terrible, right? This is no one, no one likes to see this image, but we have four types of hemorrhagic transformation. Uh, the first two, A and B, uh, HT1 and 2, these, are, these have no mass effect, uh, but the, the pH1 and pH2, which is C and D, has mass effect and they're terrible, right? They have more than 50% mortality. And this is not common, alhamdulillah. Uh, it's about five to 7% after both, uh, five to 8% after both alteplase and, uh, and uh, mechanical thrombectomy. And the most reliable predictor of hemorrhagic transformation is the infarct size with a lot of studies that show that the larger the infarct size associated with the higher risk of transformation, even in patients who are not treated with, uh, with thrombolytics. It is a form of cerebral hyperperfusion and this term used uh, a lot before in, uh, in carotid revascularization, either with the, and that's why in, after carotid revascularization, revascularization there is this, uh, a strict blood pressure goal less than 140 because uh, either either from the stenting or the surgery because of the risk of hyperperfusion, right? Um, pH2 is associated, hemorrhagic transformation pH2 is associated with more than 50% poor outcomes, uh, modified ranking scale of, uh, of four and more and mortality, which is six. And most hemorrhagic transformation occur within 12 hours with the median of, uh, of eight hours. And that's where the uh, post-procedure or post alteplase post-thrombotic, uh, thrombolytic imaging uh, comes in handy. Um, so a lot of these patients will have, or a lot of protocols, stroke protocols will have repeat imaging within, within eight to 24 hours. Earlier, of course, if there is worsening of symptoms. Uh, post TPA and post the hemorrhagic transformation is about, they were just like you said, four to eight or five to eight percent.
Um, the management is always, always, always starts with early recognition. So low threshold for repeat imaging. So your patient who had mild dysarthria is now having moderate to severe dysarthria or um, like the three out of five, we have four out of five weakness is now three out of five weakness, especially if they were treated with thrombolytics or recanalization, they should get a repeat imaging as soon as possible. Um, most of these hemorrhagic transformation, they start subtle. Uh, the only way to detect it is with frequent uh, neuro testing, right? Your clinical exam is your guidance. And there are two important determinants of outcomes. So rapid hemodynamic control immediately. So whatever the blood pressure is, the patient bled on, uh, it needs to be controlled and the reversal of coagulopathy. Um, and it's sometimes it's frustrated. So you'd have, it's rare, it doesn't happen that much, but sometimes you'll have a patient who had a hemorrhagic transformation with a blood pressure of 140, like how, how, how low can you, can you drop them? But most of the hemorrhagic transformation happens on a higher blood pressure. Um, it starts with prevention. So hemodynamic management, we talked about the goals like in recanalize and unrecanalize patient. Um, but it's still unclear what is the blood pressure goal in those patients who are after mechanical thrombectomy or what are the what are what is the rules for blood pressure goal or blood pressure determination. And even after hemorrhagic transformation, like what is the target blood pressure? How much should you control the blood pressure? If you have somebody who bled on a blood pressure of 170, it's easy, right? You drop them. Um, the, the, or it's not easy, but but deriving the data from the hemorrhagic stroke, you will probably drop them into less than 140, right? But if you have a patient who bled, who bled at blood pressure of 140, how are you like how much are you gonna drop their blood pressure? Is it a number or is it a percentage? So it's still unclear now. And I think part of it is that because it does happen, but it's not as common as uh, as ischemic stroke, right? For example. Um and it's best to individualize the blood pressure goal following revascularization. We talked about this to meet the cerebral and cardiac perfusion and the systemic perfusion. The reversal of coagulopathy depends if the patient receive alteplase, therapeutic anticoagulation, or have low platelets. But in patients who, re who receive alteplase, uh, the goal fibrinogen is less than 150. And this is corrected by giving cryoprecipitate. Every 10 unit does increase the fibrinogen by 50 points. Uh, platelet transfusion is recommended because there is, uh, even with the normal platelets after IVTPA, uh, there is a theoretical risk of platelet inhibition. Uh, so usually patients will get six to eight units. Um, PCC is the first line treatment uh, for warfarin related hemorrhagic transformation. So patients who are on warfarin and they had a stroke and now they have hemorrhagic transformation with INR of like 2.4. So the first line treatment should be the PCC uh, because it's the fastest, it's faster than FFE, lower volume and, uh, and longer effect. So it reverses anticoagulation and correct INR within 30 minutes. And we talked about my patients, one of my first patients, this is, a, this is very troubling. So patients who have a hemorrhagic transformation of an ischemic stroke and have a cardiac valve, like what are you gonna do with those patients on when to start the anticoagulation? And the, the answer is, and again, it's not like guideline or anything, but the answer is that it's very individualized and it varies from patient to patient. It's gonna depend on the duration of the stroke. It's gonna depend on the size of the stroke and the hemorrhage and whether or not you can do frequent imaging. Uh, for the novel oral anticoagulant, for the longest time, we didn't have an antidote. We didn't have uh, a reversal agent. But now, uh, alhamdulillah, we do. So the Begetran is, uh, is reversed by Idorosizumab. Abexiban, Rivaroxiban, and Edoxiban have a, a factor 10 mimic, which is Andexnet. And if neither of those are available, PCC is your, is your go-to, right? Because there is partial reversal with PCC. And we talked about medical, medical treatment, medical treatment, but surgery is also an option. So surgery should be considered after correcting coagulopathy in patients where the hematoma is accessible. 
by however, how, like whatever techniques we have. So either many, many invasive, stereotactic intervention, or cranial, or if not, for decompressive hemicranial. And we'll talk about decompressive hemicranial in general. Another one, another big one in the, uh, in the ICU is cerebral edema. And it's seen with, uh, it's seen with moderate to large strokes. Uh, young people less than 55 and females are more prone to cerebral edema and the effect of cerebral edema because of the low compensatory intracranial space. It has a prevalence of 20 per 100,000 people. Now it's the opposite, right? The treatment is uh, for these patients, the, the, uh, the uh, treatment for these patients uh, with big cerebral edema, because cerebral edema, edema do happen in, in all kinds of strokes, but usually if it's more than 50% of the MCA territory, the definitive treatment is surgery. And it's usually with, uh, with, uh, hemi with a decompressive hemicranial with a minimal flap diameter of 15 centimeters. Best uh, or maximum benefits is done within, if, if it is done prophylactically within 48 hours. Um, so a lot of studies, uh, did try to do it as like last minute before the patient herniate, and it does not have the same <clears throat> the same benefits. Um, and the evidence for that comes on from comes from a pooled analysis of three large clinical trials. Right, it did include patients younger than sixty years old with a night stroke more than fifteen and more than fifteen percent, fifty percent territory of the MCA. And the surgery can be done within 48 hours, but it did show improved mortality by 50% uh, and improved in the functional outcome by 16%. And you can see this is from the pooled analysis of the th three trials. Conservative treatment has a mortality rate of 70%, right? And this mortality rate goes down to 22%. So this is where your 50% absolute risk reduction comes in. Um, and also a lot of these patients, but a lot of these patients, a lot, a lot of the 50% that were, uh, that were, uh, that their lives were saved, uh, ended up in a modified ranking scale of five or four. So very, uh, very disabled, right? But a good number, like from 19% to 29%, a good number had uh, good functional outcome. This is 21% and this is 33%. Uh, and it's statistically significant. But again, the, the inclusion criteria was younger than 60, NIH more than 15, and done within 48 hours. Another trial in 20, uh, another trial, which is the DESTINY2 trial, did study the hemicranectomy in patients who are older than 60 years old. And the maximum benefit, and the same thing, high NIH stroke scale, and done within 48 hours. And the biggest uh, benefit was mainly in the survival, uh, not really the functional outcome. And this is where, uh, and this is, and this is where the. Uh, so you see here the control group the, again seventy percent mortality, um, and went down to thirty three at six months and forty three uh, percent at uh, at twelve months. But a lot of these patients ended up severely disabled or dependent. And this is where the discussion comes in between the, the, um, the physician, the, the intensivist, the, uh, the surgeon, and the, the family of the patient on what this surgery aims to. So it's life-saving, right? It's not to preserve function. There are some patients who, are, who, are, who had good outcomes at 12 months. There are like 11 patients in total, uh, or six patients, 11 patients in total who had good outcome, good functional outcomes or decent functional outcomes. But this is not the rule, right? We go by, by probability, not possibility. Um, so a good discussion between the patients, uh, between the, the family and the, and the physician, sh physician should make the goal of this surgery clear that it's life-saving. Uh, it may or may not improve outcome, most, more likely not to improve the functional status of the patient. Um, for posterior circulation stroke, uh, there is a lot of overwhelming practice to perform surgical decompression for cerebellar stroke, especially if it's involving more than 33%, like one third of the cerebellum. And the reason why is that the posterior fossa is a very tight compartment. 
and the risk of brainstem compression is high. So prophylactic suboccipital decompression prevents significant neurological deterioration. And this, and this, is, this is like a standard practice now. Um, especially, well, not especially, like uh, there shouldn't be any brainstem uh, infarction to prevent that. Because once patients have a brainstem infarction, you are gonna prevent death. But if they did have severe disability, you're not gonna reverse that. Uh, now to something a little more controversial, which is the hyperosmolar therapy. And we're talking specifically about stroke patients, right? We're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about uh, TBI, we're not talking about hemorrhagic stroke or malignant uh, uh, or refractory ICP. We're talking about stroke and the mannitol and hypertonic saline in whatever form are the mainstay treatment as a temporizing measure for acute reduction in ICB prior to decompressive surgery. So uh, if you have a patient who, are, who, is, who had a stroke yesterday and you anticipate that this patient is going to decompress, uh, and this patient is doing okay, uh, two days, three days, and then they deteriorated and started showing signs of herniation, your first line treatment as a medication, medicate like there is like elevating the head of the bed and hyperventilation and all these things, but medication wise should be mannitol or hypertonic sal uh, saline bolus. And this has been shown to 75% of the times to reverse herniation in anticipation for surgery. Now the problem comes in with the, with the, second, with the second part of this slide is that this approach when undertaking prophylactically or pro uh, or uh, pro sorry, protractically, with the hope to avoid neuroceric decompression has been questioned by numerous published studies. So, um, and, and we can show some of these studies. And these studies, and there are, some of these are animal studies and some of these are, uh, are clinical studies. There is no RCTs, uh, but what, the, what, the, uh, what, a lot of, what a lot of investigators uh, notice is that if you are using, uh, hyperosmolar therapy to trying to avoid or prevent surgery, what you end up doing is, is delaying the need for surgery. So a lot of these patients will end up having surgery, but not within 48 hours. They wait like four or five, or five days until they get into surgery. Um, and also the downfall, of, <clears throat> the downfall of, of using this approach is that if you have somebody on, on, on mannitol with max uh, or, or someone in hypertonic saline with the sodium of 155 or 158, and then they get worse. You don't have a lot of margins to use a bolus of hypertonic saline. The same goes for mannitol. If you are maxed on hyperosmolarity, yes, you get, you get to get the mannitol, but then you may run into complications and renal failure. Uh, so a lot of these studies, uh, so the conclusion of, of all of that is that, yes, hyperosmolar has a role, and it's usually a temporizing role while you are preparing this patient for surgery because that's the definitive treatment. Um, there is uh, no superiority for, for or the, actually, the, but in stroke, there is no superiority for hypertonic saline or mannitol. There is some... Uh, literature from the TBI trials that shows uh, marginal benefits of hypertonic saline versus mannitol, especially in the bolus administration. Um, sustained hypernatremia is, uh, can be harmful, if, uh, especially if there is an increase in hyperchloremia, uh, hyper, if there is hyperchloremia or acidosis, uh, can definitely, especially not in stroke, but especially in TBI with refractory ICB, you can use both hypertonic saline and mannitol, uh, as long as uh, you maintain an osmolar, uh, a reasonable osmolar gap. And there is always, 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 especially with the, with the continuous use of, of mannitol or hypertonic saline, there, all, there should always be uh, holding parameters, right? So the holding parameters, usually most of the time, it's uh, sodium more than 155 or uh, for hypertonic saline or, or serum oz more than uh, 325 for mannitol. Okay, fever control. Um, whether it is central fever, if it's infection and sepsis has to be treated, of course, right? If it's central fever, still has to be treated. 
because observational studies showed that fever has a deter detrimental effect on every stroke measure, length of stay, functional outcome, mortality, uh, everything they can think of, you'll find a study that shows that fever uh, worsens that measure. And fever in most of these studies is uh, defined as 30, more than 37.5. The opposite of that, therapeutic hypothermia, uh, although it's, it's beneficial in managing ICB and cerebral edema in TBI patients, uh, in, in, cerebral, in, in refractory uh, ICP in, in cerebral edema TBI patient, with the initial promising evidence that showed maybe there is a benefit of large hemispheric stroke, but two randomized controlled trials, one in Europe and one in the US, were stopped early because of futility or harm. And I think big part of that was because of the cooling devices they used, which was an intravascular cooling. So there was more DVTs, more PEs, more deaths. Um, there is an ongoing interpreted randomized controlled trial testing targeted temperature management to 37 uh, in large hemispheric stroke. And they were including both um, treated, uh, both like non recanalized patients with canalized patients. Um, and the goal, generally speaking, should be fever treatment and prevention, not hypo hypothermia. I used to I used to have a lot of hope for hypothermia and stroke, but it's so disappointing now. Okay, big issue: hyperglycemia. Diabetes is very common among stroke patients, um, but there are forty percent of stroke patients who did not have diabetes who have hyperglycemia, and it's probably a stress response, high cortisol, high uh, high blood sugar but it's associated with the higher infarct growth, hemorrhagic transformation, poor functional outcomes, mortality, same as fever, right? Everything is worse when you have hyperglycemia. Uh, um, and the mechanism of that is not, uh, is, is, is through multiple mechanism, right? So endothelial dysfunction, impaired fibrinolysis, and increase in the oxidative stress response. So hyperglycemia is bad. And for forever, there was this question, okay, how much, like how much control of blood sugar should we do? Uh, until 2019, where there is the SHINE trial, which we actually were part of in, uh, in Miami. We did include a good number of patients. Um, but it was very simple methodology, right? The inclusion criteria is stroke hyperglycemia, not necessarily diabetes. And patients were divided into two groups. The intensive blood sugar control is down 140 versus standard blood sugar control, 140 to 180. And the effect of that on the functional outcomes at three months. Um, the patients in the intensive blood sugar control uh, were controlled using an insulin uh, infusion uh, versus the control group or the standard group 140 to 180 used uh, a, a, slide, a standard insulin sliding scale. And the modified or the functional outcome were defined as modified ranking scale of zero for milder stroke moderate stroke were one and uh, severe, more severe stroke for, for it was two, right? And this is the result. There was, there was, there was no superiority for, or there is no benefits from strict uh, blood sugar control. Um, the patients who ended up in modified rank scale one, two, or three were similar in both groups. Um, so the good outcome, our good outcome was modifying a scale zero, which is this. So 23 versus 21. Um, and the nice stroke scale was 1, 19, 17. And a nice stroke scale, um, MRS of three was 14 versus nine and was not statistically significant. And it kind of goes along with the, uh, with the literature from the, uh, from the, from the uh, general critical care literature, which showed that there's no benefits in ICU patients. Uh, of maintaining strict hyperglycemia, high, um, strict normal glycemia. And of course, just like that, uh, there was more hypoglycemic events in the uh, strict normal glycemia group. So the goal now is less than 180. Uh, renal failure is, is a little special in, uh, uh, is a, uh, yeah, special in patients with stroke. Uh, it's associated with poor functional outcomes in stroke patients, whether it's an acute renal failure that requires renal replacement therapy, or uh, if it's a, a patient who has CKD and stage renal disease and is, is getting uh, regular dialysis. 
but both patients, especially in large hemispheric stroke, uh, whether it's new or uh, a CKD patient, they are at risk of ICP elevation, blood, blood pressure variation, and fluid shift during HD, right? So the continuous renal, renal replacement therapy CVVH is recommending as an alternative to minimize the fluid shift and better control of blood pressure. So even patients who are who have who has uh, end stage renal disease and on dialysis, they should be shifted to CVVH to minimize the fluid shift and the uh, better control of, of blood pressure. Uh, nutrition, we need food. Stroke patients need food, right? As in any uh, critically ill patient, uh, enteral feeding tube should be started within 48 hours to avoid uh, catabolism. If the patient has dysphagia, use a, like a nasogastric or nasodudinal uh, feeding tube because it may reduce the risk of aspiration. And I know, I know a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of people who argue whether or not it does, but it looks like it's the safest approach. Um, all stroke patients should have an assessment of speech and swallow function to determine the need, whether these patients can swallow what kind of food. It's best done by a speech and, and language pathologist, right? A speech therapist. This is the best. This, is, uh, this has been shown actually to, to be uh, effective, uh, to, be, to, to categorize patients into their appropriate groups. And if the patient failed swallowing, uh, there may be a need for an internal uh, uh, feeding tube with a percutaneous gastrostomy. Okay. Um, from everything I spoke about, the, we still don't have, we still don't have don't have a don't have a, an optimal blood pressure target in recanalized recanalized patient. There is no uh, there is no specific number to target in the blood pressure on when, for how long, which patient, and how. There is also no data on which is better, continuous infusion versus boluses. Um, we still don't know what is the, or we, we're still gonna have a, a solid answer. What is the blood pressure goal after hemorrhagic transformation? All of what we are setting is extrapolated from the hemorrhagic stroke literature. And the, the mechanism is different. And we spoke a little bit about, okay, what if they have hemorrhagic, like it's not the same to have a hemorrhagic transformation at the blood pressure of 180 versus 140. Um, we are still working on reducing the risk of hemorrhagic transformation <clears throat> after recanalization with everything that we're doing. But I, th I think there is still a lot of room to go. Um, I know I spoke about hyperosmolar therapy and hemispheric stroke as a temporizing measure, but I do still believe that there is a role for the use of hyperosmolar therapy. It's just not it, like we didn't figure out the, the proper use of them. I don't know if there is going to be a protocol in the near future that would, that would, uh, that would show some benefits. Um, and there is no hypothermia. But there is, for, for now at least, hypothermia is not recommended for stroke patients, but we still don't know what the, we know that fever is bad for stroke patients, but we don't know if the targeted temperature management in acute strokes is gonna be beneficial. We'll see what the result of the interpret uh, study is. Uh, to summarize everything we spoke about, uh, acute ischemic stroke admissions to ICU is increasing and it is going to be increasing. Uh, given how complex the management of the ischemic stroke is. Um, in terms of blood pressure management, there is no one size fits all. It should be individualized for every patient based on their needs. Decompressive hemicremia is best done prophylactically within 48 hours. And uh, for now, hyper, hyperosmolar agent is best used as a bridging therapy to, for surgery in malignant MCA stroke. The last, the last line is about blood blood glucose control, and the target is less than 180 in acute ischemic stroke, no need for the strict management of blood, of, uh, of blood sugar. Okay, this is me done. Thank you very much. And um, we'll open the floor for any questions. Thank you.
شكرا جزيلا دكتور رامي انا عمر ايوب سوشيال بروفيسور في نيورولوجي وستروك نيوروكولوجيال كير في كينج عبد العزيز يونيفرستي ذا واز ريلي ريلي انتريستينج اند فيري كومبريهنسيف ريفيو um thank you for the effort that you collected all of these data in one uh, one hour uh, that is huge uh, so thank you very much um okay. i think we'll uh, try to get a few of the questions if possible okay if anyone has question please uh, direct it to the chat and then we'll direct it to dr rami Um, yeah, if um, nobody is asking, I will ask you. Now, when it comes to hemic trainees, I think um, oh, you can see a lot of disparities in all over the country. Yeah, and, um, we have in some centers and within the same center, some believers in the hemicrinectomies where neurosurgeons are very excited to do it prophylactically, and some of them, they do it extremely late. And I think part of um, the problem in many hospitals is that people or neurosurgeons tend to say, please call us with, if the patient, you know, has blown pupil, which is, in my opinion, is extremely late. Yeah. And then when you call them at that time, they will say, oh, it's too late, end of story. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on, on, on this? How, how do you think we can improve uh, awareness, improve uh, practice, improve, um, you know, uh, uh, unification of, uh, of practice? I think that the data, the data speak for itself, Dr. Omar. So the, uh, in order to get the same outcomes, you have to stick to the same protocol, right? And I think uh, there should be a lot of, not a lot, but a lot of communication between the, uh, the, inter, the, inter, the, the surgeons, the intensivists, and the neurologists on how to come with a protocol that streamline this, uh, this whole uh, uh, process uh, without a lot of, a lot of, uh, of, of, of human input, right? I know. I know for surgery, like the surgeon is the one who is doing the surgery, and they are they they they're going to be responsible for the surgery and and the outcomes of the surgery. But at the same time, I think presenting that data in a way that uh, and coming up with a protocol that is uh, that is fair for everyone that shows that the benefit is best when done. Just like you said, when it's, when it's, if the patient has a blown pupil, you're already late. You should have done the, the, uh, the hemicrania yesterday. And the fact that you can, you can reverse the herniation with, uh, with hyperosmolar therapy has nothing to do with the outcomes, right? So yes, you did, you did that and there is no blown pupil and the patient went to surgery, but uh, we all know that even with herniation, there is there can be ischemic changes that happens to the brainstem, and the uh, the outcome that you're hoping for with doing the surgery, you may not achieve because of that part. Um, so I think communication and and these these studies are not new, and I don't think there is any new studies that challenge the outcomes of this, but I think it's also reasonable. Uh, that patient selection and uh, family discussions to be taken um, like in a, in a multidisciplinary way to set the expectations right that if the patient is old and he's getting the hemicrani, um, the point is that to, it's life-saving, right? It's not, uh, it's, not, it's not for functional benefits and, it, and it's different if it's a younger patient. Okay. But I think there have to be communication, there have to be a protocol that everyone agrees on, which can be challenging at times. Okay, and following the same line, now, um, uh, if let's say you have seen someone um, with, with massive, let's say a massive stroke in the MCA, and you, you think there is a, a high ICP, there are the signs for it, and you started your uh, hyperosmolar, and the patient was not taken to the OR. How long would you maintain hyperosmolar therapy? Uh, and then when do you stay, oh, this is my stopping point. I have to just stop uh, doing what- Yes, so, uh, and there was, there was some literature about the use of intermittent uh, hyperosmolar therapy in, in areas where you cannot do uh, hemicrani. And the way they did it is that, okay, the, you have the patient, um, for example, is worsening, uh, you're, you're 
trying to get him to the OR. There is no OR, so you give hyperosmolar therapy. The next dose of hyperosmolar therapy, and I'm talking about all boluses, should be guided by the exam. So if the exam improve, and most likely the exam is gonna improve tempor uh, temporarily, um, and you'll wait for the next time the patient is gonna have a worsening exam. This is what uh, one study was doing. Another uh, another study tried the uh, tried the like the continuous infusion of three percent saline, and what happens is that at certain point you exceed the capacity of hypertonic saline with the cytotoxic and the and the uh, basogenic edema. You exceed the capacity of of hypertonic saline to minimize the tissue shift and herniation, and you end up either this patient is going to the OR, or this patient is gonna die. There's nothing I can do. And it's, it's a very tough spot. I mean, uh, especially if it's something like if there's no hemicrany or the, the, the patient is hemodynamically unstable or you have some barriers to do the hemicrany. It's very, it's a tough spot, it's very frustrating, but those are the two protocols that, they, that have been used. Um, for the audience, do you have any questions for Dr. Rami? I could uh, keep asking you all the questions of the world. <laughs> Dr. Islam is raising his hand, Dr. Omar. Dr. Islam, Islam Khattab, and Dr. Yeah. Maryam. There are two people raising their hands. Perfect. So I will unmute Dr. Islam. Dr. Islam. I'm unmuting you, Fadl. Yes, please, Dr. Islam. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Islam. Yeah, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Dr. Islam. I'm working in SMC in Abu Dhabi. And uh, actually, I'm in surgical ICU, and we have actually many patients with uh, First of all, I forgot to thank Dr. Rami for this uh, nice and comprehensive lecture. So uh, my question is about uh, using a, a transcranial doubler in, uh, in your stroke unit, or how is your experience with that? Um, OK, so the question about the use of, uh, of TCP. Transcranial doubler. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's... I was trained. I um, I think the transcranial Doppler uh, have been mostly used in subarachnoid hemorrhage to to detect uh, vasospasm. Um, and in, I was trained on 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 TCDs. Like the the way in the neuro ICU was run was not by the use of microdialysis catheter or the use of frequent uh, uh, CTAs or or multiple angiogram to detect vasospasm. So it has a lot of use in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, in, uh, in stroke patients, there have been two uses. One of them was for to detect if there is any microembolize in patients with, uh, with fresh stents. And also to, as, as a surrogate marker for, uh, for increased ICP. So a lot of these, a lot of patients would have increased velocity. Uh, and it's usually the pattern that you see on the affected hemisphere the TCDs numbers are gonna go up as there is higher ICP. There is, uh, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with any with any other uses. Okay. Or TCD and and the, uh, another question, actually, uh, it's not related to stroke, but, but for subarachnoid hemorrhage per se, mm -hmm. and uh, for how long you will keep the patients in ICU in subarachnoid patients? Good grade, bad if grade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's really a challenge. You need to keep the patient. Sometimes you keep fluctuating GCS and you don't know if they are going into vasospasm. We'll keep channel, you know, checking daily. The, the minimum the is blood. three weeks. The minimum is, this is what I do, is three weeks. Uh, for, this is like a general rule. The, the exception would be patients with uh, non aneurysmal subarachnoid. Um, would be less, especially with uh, if if you have like two angios that are negative, so you'll and they have a stable exam for a week or ten days. Most most intensivists would <clears throat> would get them out of the ICU. 
Um, the vasospasm window is up to 21 days. And, the, uh, and I think you and I and everyone have seen patients do extremely well until there's day 18 or 19 and they'll start having vasospasm. I think it's yeah. worth it to keep them for three weeks. Uh, with the low grade uh, doing well, walking in the ICU with their, uh, you know, with their police catheter in their hand, the, the urine bag, and they're... Um, Especially if you have... Uh... Yes, uh, I think some literature suggested two weeks in the ICU and one week in the, in the stroke unit. But, the, but there is, like the rule is three weeks and then you can, you can, uh, you can, you can modify it carefully depending on the patient. Okay, I think there is uh, another question, Dr. Ahmed Said. Yeah, please go ahead. You are unmuted. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, decompression surgery. It uh, has proven that uh, it improves mortality, but on the other hand, it increases the disability. So my question is, is there anything to do to decrease this disability? Uh, so the question is uh, is about decompressive hemicranium. It improves mortality, but uh, but worsens uh, functionality, right? And is there any way to to improve? Uh, um, so in 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 patients who are younger than six years old, it improves both, right? It improves the 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 mortality by 50% and uh, it reduce the mortality by 50% and improve the functional outcomes by 16%. But in, in patients who are older than that, it's, it, it does not worsen the, worsen the functional outcomes, but it has to be like not the hemicrania itself, but the fact that the patients are older and they have uh, uh, comorbidities. What improved is that patient, uh, mortality. But a lot of these patients that their lives were saved, they have no mortality, ended up severely disabled because of their stroke. It's not because of the hemicrania itself. Um, but the stroke, in, but the hemicrania, instead of them dying, it just saved their life and have them disabled, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so, what, what um, I don't know. I think a better care of stroke patients. Also, there is also an entire literature behind the the treatment of uh, or the management, the blood pressure management and hyperosmolar management following decompressive hemicrania. But there is nothing solid so far. Uh, a lot of patients will a lot not a lot like some investigators are trying to see if there is any certain blood pressure goal that would improve the outcomes. Any certain uh, duration of using hyperosmolar therapy, um, and also the the use of of secondary secondary stroke prophylaxis after the hemicrania, whether we should wait. I think I think the average people wait for uh, for three to five days after hemicrania. Um, whether we should imply it earlier, I think there is it's, some of this is going into that. But the biggest thing is that the the hemicrania itself it, it just saves in older patients. It saved their life, but they will live a disabled life. Statistically speaking, Allah Alam, statistically speaking. Yeah, um, one more question. Um, Dr. Mahdi, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Rami. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, hyperosmolar therapy. Is there any role to continue hyperosmolar therapy uh, after uh, decompressive uh, craniotomy? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. So the question is uh, the role of continuation of decompressive therapy after uh, after decompressive hemicrania. Um, uh, there is there is no guidance. My personal thought is that the patient is decompressed, so why do you need to continue that, unless the patient exam fluctuate with the use of uh, of hyperosmolar therapy. So if you have a patient coming from the OR, um, 
and uh, they get decompression and their exam improved from before going to the OR. And then they took a dip like six hours after because in the OR patients usually receive uh, hyperosmolar therapy. So if the effect of that wore off and then the patient got worse, the first thing of course is to repeat imaging, make sure that they didn't bleed or develop any sort of complication. But uh, they probably showed you that they, 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 need, they need some sort of hyperosmolar therapy. I don't think even, even with that, I don't think it's gonna be for a prolonged period. It's not gonna be more than 48 hours. Okay. Um, any more questions? Because I don't see anybody is raising his hands or her hand. Okay, if that's the case, I would like again to thank you, Dr. Rami, for the comprehensive um, uh, lecture. And, and I thank everyone who stayed along with us for almost one and a half hours. And I think, inshallah, we'll see you again uh, in the next meeting for the Southern Neurocritical and the guidance of Dr. Haifa al -Githami. Thank you very much and have a lovely weekend. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Okay, thank you very much.